Welcome to episode 343 of the Shared Security Podcast. And this week, we're going to play a game. A game of Monopoly. That's right. <laughs> Do not pass go. Do not collect $200 billion. <laughs> <laughs> I am talking about Google, who has recently been accused by the U.S. Justice Department as a monopoly. So we're going to talk about that and what that means for you and your privacy and cybersecurity, because there is an angle to that I'm going to bring up. And then in our Aware Much segment, for those of you still attempting to have conversations with your Alexa smart speaker, let's see if I set somebody's off by saying I was going to say, uh, <laughs> yell, yell yeah. buy a hundred the... episodes of something or other. <laughs> yes. Well, we'll talk about the key privacy settings that you need to be aware of. And joining me for these stories and much, much more, the entire cast of this podcast, Kevin and Scott, they're both here. Everyone's Hello, here. Listen, I have Hello, the Gilligan Island theme song going through my head now, and I'm not sure why. Like Something about what you just said made... Somehow I need to put a put that song in this podcast without getting banned by YouTube. <laughs> by YouTube, yeah. <laughs> for Three for copyright door. infringement. <laughs> yes. Maybe just because I said YouTube and copyright infringement, I'm probably getting flagged probably. in my video. <laughs> but anyway, welcome back, guys. Kevin, you're back. Well, how you been? Busy, which is good, but busy. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of travel, and I've, I'm actually home for the most part for two weeks. I, uh, I'm zipping down to Orlando for an event Wednesday, but other than that, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. And then all of September, I think every oh. single week I travel. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So we'll just skip September then. And no, no, no. We'll I see I, you again. <laughs> what I say is we'll figure it out. I, I, my travel <laughs> yeah, I is weird. Yeah. You've got a couple days here and there. I'm sure yeah, that I'm home Good. for a day or two and then we'll see. Good. Well, welcome back because we. We missed your rants and <laughs> we missed. I have the... no rants for today. I agree. No, with none. That, everything Are you that sure? happened, I agree with. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, do you agree that uh, Google is a monopoly? Let's no. just start right off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Well, I mean, I guess I do. Really? The court said they are. I, mm -hmm. I, so I'm not sure where I stand on this. I, I think we should talk about the story first. You know, uh, the, the Justice Department has been. Talked about them being a monopoly for years. Yes, they have. Judge, what was it, a 270-something page decision? Oh, it's massive. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Here's the thing that I find funny. They used the idea that people switched from Yahoo to Google as proof they're not a monopoly because people can switch. Uh-huh, um, sure. I think, that, I think the key thing, and I, I don't know whether this makes them a monopoly or what, whatever, I think the issue is that they're the default engine and they pay billions for that right. Right. You know, because the at least one of the articles talked about in Edge, where Bing is the default, they have the same level of usage. Like if you just look at Edge, Bing is 80% of the market, Google's 80% mm -hmm. of the market, or 80 something percent of the market everywhere else. So that tells me that the default setting is the thing and i don't know i i know that you know like firefox is funded in large part by those types of payments is it okay it, it is it okay for a company to spend money i guess my question is how is that different than the company buying advertising yeah right. well i mean it, it's complicated first yeah. of all yeah yes it right is. it definitely is but I, I guess i look at it this way of if the Justice Department has come up with essentially evidence saying that they have prevented other search engines. Like we're talking about Google search yeah. specifically. Yep. Yeah. Just so everyone knows, right? I mean, Google has a lot of other products. That they haven't killed yet. That they haven't taken uh. out of beta or whatever, right? That's a whole other topic probably. But yeah, I mean, they're, it's really about search and the other search engines like DuckDuckGo and StartPage and Bing saying that they have that Google has an unfair advantage because of how frankly powerful they are in terms of like what you said Kevin 
paying other browsers to make them the default search, going and doing other things as well, probably through their advertising and the way that they advertise yep. Google search, that it becomes essentially a monopoly. I mean, let's be honest, other search engines really don't stand a chance. See, I don't, I don't, I don't. know if, I don't know if that's true. Hmm. And, and the reason okay. I don't know if that's true, I guess my answer is if you are starting in a field and you don't have a lot of money, does that make the company ahead of you a monopoly mm -hmm. because they have lots of money? And this is based on the idea that the article is correct, that the buying default setting is how they've done this. If, like you mm -hmm. said, if the Department of Justice has some other type of evidence that says, hey, here's, here's where Google went to Mozilla and said, uh, here's a billion dollars to make us the default. And oh, by the way, if you don't make us the default, we're going to trash you or, I, you know what I mean, like mm -hmm. threaten them, intimidate them, something like that. Then I got no issue with this. I just, I don't know. I, and, I, and I'm not arguing for or against. I'm, I'm just saying that the, the fact that they have more money than their competitors shouldn't mean that makes them a monopoly. That's called success. That's a, I don't, I don't think that's point. what they're saying, though. I mean... I, I'm not an economic expert by any means, but I mean, the, the term monopoly, I think is, has to be defined, you know, and I think about a lot of economists probably understand it better than I do, or maybe you guys do. But the point of it is, I think, um, uh, anti-competitive behavior, right? Making things more expensive right. for your competitors because you can. Right. But, but that's what I'm saying is. According to the article, the article is saying they have such a high percentage because they're the default and they are the default mm. because they've paid for it. That's not an anti-competitive behavior in my mind. Okay. Anti-competitive yeah, so, behavior is, because I agree with you, monopoly is anti-competitive. You, you're doing something to prevent people from competing with you, whatever. Based on the articles I've read, I've not seen the evidence. I've not, right? Like I'm not yeah. arguing. For I think, Google I guess what they're trying to say is that it's prohibitively expensive for new people to enter the market or compete with them. Okay, and then let me ask you a question. How do you become an ISP? Like if you wanted to be a cable provider in your neighborhood, how do you do it? Is it not prohibitively expensive? I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to do it anyway. I know it. I <laughs> actually looked difficult. at becoming an, like, to become an ISP in my neighborhood back. Mm -hmm. we, we couldn't get good service. We... And I looked at what it would take, and it was prohibitively expensive. But the government has ruled time and time again that Comcast is not a monopoly. <laughs> right? I, and That's I'm not, true. I'm not arguing. Scott, I, I think you're right, that if they're doing anti-competitive things, and I have no doubt Google is doing anti-competitive yeah. things at some level, right? Yeah. But, but the idea that they are the default engine... And they're the default engine because they paid for it. That sounds like capitalism to me. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not. I'm not arguing that they are yeah. or they aren't. I'm just saying I think it's a very complex construct. Oh, the whole idea of monopolies totally. and anti-competitive. And I think you're right, Kevin. There's lots of examples of situations where you'd say, "Why is this considered anti-competitive? Like, where's the line?" Right? Yeah, I don't think we have a good idea of the line. Yeah. Having said that, I will tell you that. I use Edge, so Bing is my default engine, and I've not changed it. They're like some. I am a more aware consumer. I am a more technical consumer, well, and yeah. you know what? You know what though? Whatever you can comes make, up works. You can make the argument though that because Bing is a Microsoft engine, yeah, and Edge is a Microsoft product, they therefore should make their search engine the default. Same thing oh, with Chrome. Yeah, I'm not right? saying. What I'm saying is. The statement that the default becomes yeah. the default. Is oh, I true. see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think I, also I have every capability of going and changing the setting to use Google or DuckDuckGo mm -hmm. or something else. You do. And I switched over to Edge mm -hmm. a couple months ago and I've just not bothered. Yeah. Right? And I, I don't think yeah. that it, the point of this initiative necessarily is to say, well, people should stop using Google or, or people should use other search engines, it's about the advertisers, right? It's like, mm -hmm. if I want to advertise, where can I advertise where I will get some results? And if Google is the only place where you're actually going to get any results, 
then that, I guess, makes them the monopoly. I don't know. There is the advertising angle in their... In Absolutely. the documentation of like how they came to this ruling, that is a big well, part of it. They yeah. they talk about how the advertising yeah. is more expensive because yep. Google doesn't have a competitor. That makes sense. Totally. I, again, I'm going to ask where's one. the line, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. the the billboard in Times Square is more expensive than the one yeah. in Opalaka, Florida. Yeah. Right? Real place. And... Uh, <laughs> um, but it also, I don't know. I, well, yeah, it, I don't know. It I, opens up I, the question. Yeah. I think it's right. going to be interesting. I think uh, we don't, we haven't heard the end of it. Google is definitely no. not letting this appeal. one stand, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I get your point, Kevin, about if you are a very successful company and you've just through success have kind of cornered the market yeah. in anything. I mean, we see this with social media, right? Yeah. Meta, they are being accused of the same thing that Google is. They just yes. haven't. And I think the court case is still pending, but I guarantee you the government's going to come out and say, yep, monopoly. And I think I want to be clear. I absolutely believe that Google has done immoral and anti-competitive things. I just, mm -hmm. what I'm reading about this decision doesn't show me that they proved that, I think is what I'm trying to say, right? I yeah. This is one of those cases where do I know that Scott Peterson killed his wife? Yes. Do I have enough evidence to show it? <laughs> nope. No. By the way, I watched that documentary this weekend. So, <laughs> oh, I'll have to watch that. That's that's a fascinating case. But it, it was um, a fascinating case, and it, it's it, to me, it's made even more fascinating based on the fact he was found guilty. Yeah. Even though, from what I can tell, and I know documentaries are not the best place. Um. Yeah. In this case, I think Google is Scott Peterson. Do I believe they're anti-competitive? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Do I believe the government really proved the case? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Real quick before we move on, though, because I, I had mentioned the security and privacy angle yeah. to all of this. And I think that's an interesting one because obviously there's a lot of speculation now that potentially they could force Google to break up into other companies. And, and that's a typical thing, right, with a monopoly. It's like they force you to break your company into different pieces or sell things off. And... Google has been under the gun for forever about privacy. And I, I want to give Google some credit. They've actually done a lot better job of giving people controls over how their data is being used. It's probably the best I've ever seen it. But I guess I worry if like the government says, yep, you got to split up and you have to you know break things off into different businesses. Like I wonder how does that affect this Google ecosystem? that we've now all gotten so used to because I think all of us now know how Google is using your data. It's well documented, but now I worry, well, what's going to happen if that, if the company is broken up? Well, and you know, that once the company's broken up, now you start seeing that data has to be shared. Yep. Wider. I think it'd make it worse. Even if they don't want to, that's mm -hmm. going to create. Yeah. Right. <laughs> It actually reminds me of a, a pretty good book that I read many years ago called The Master Switch. Um, I can't remember the, the name of the author, but uh, it actually covers monopolies from the time of the telephone, the adventure of the telephone, you know, in, in communication, in movies, and, you know, how the whole movie theater industry has kind of changed. And the, the bottom line seems to be in, in almost every industry, there's like a pendulum effect, right? Where... Things go too far one yeah. way and then, you know, the monopoly and then they get broken up and there's advantages to both, right? Um, you know, in a non-monopolized market, you get what you want. You know, you can get more personalized stuff and in a more monopolized market, you kind of take what's there, <laughs> but it's actually generally easier and cheaper in the monopoly. So anyways, yeah. just thought I'd mention the book. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I'll look that up and we'll add it to our uh, show notes for sure. Are you still relying on outdated managed file transfer tools? In today's world, the security of your sensitive data is more critical than ever. Introducing KiteWorks, the most secure and modern managed file transfer platform available. KiteWorks is audited yearly and continuously monitored by certified third-party assessors. 
with an ongoing bounty program, regular penetration testing, and one-click appliance updates, KiteWorks minimizes vulnerabilities like no other. Many traditional MFT solutions can't compare to the level of security and functionality KiteWorks provides. But that's not all. KiteWorks offers a world-class secure file sharing and email platform. Easily send automated or ad hoc files through fully integrated shared folders and email. Administrators can manage policies in a unified console and create custom integrations with their comprehensive REST API. Step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks. Visit KiteWorks.com to get started. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. All right, so let's move on to Kevin's favorite segment, which we love to call Aware Much. Yes, Tom, we do indeed aware much today. Do you guys uh, have an Echo or an Alexa app by any chance that you guys use? Yes. Yes. I use it all the time. Interesting. I, I use it for my shopping list. Oh. Um, so when I'm, when I'm in the kitchen and I need something, I throw it over there. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm still looking for a good recipe collection app because I see all these mm. great recipes in you know, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever. And uh, I don't have a good place to, easy way to store them. And so what ends up, ha I'm, I have the problem tonight. I'm trying to figure out what I want to make for dinner. I know I've got 200 recipes I've looked at over the last week. And 200, holy cow. Can't, wow. I'm making up that number, but I, I can't mm -hmm. remember which one, where they are, or what they are. So yeah, total well. tangent. But if anybody's got a good recipe collection app, I need it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Kevin. Absolutely. Yes. Well, today we're looking at an article about Alexa privacy settings. And it's interesting because the author, you know, has been living with Alexa. I think they said they have one in every room, including their bathrooms. Wow. <laughs> and they generally like it uh, for the things that it does well. But I think it does annoy them as well. It's, it says sometimes it just speaks out when no wake word was mentioned. Yes, <laughs> totally annoying. Yeah. I hate that. Especially, yeah. I have not right. ever had an Alexa, so I'm counting on you guys no. to. Uh, oh, we to should ship one. Speak up, yeah. But uh, in this uh, article, it actually provides some useful tips on the privacy settings. So you can, um, I think it looks like you have to do it from your mobile phone, either yep. Android or iOS. Um, but you have to from the app go to the more, then settings, then privacy, and then uh, manage your data. There's a few settings in there for how long voice recordings can be saved. A minimum, it looks like, is three months, which is interesting. But um, you can also, I, I think, delete them uh, on demand mm -hmm. if, if you want. Uh, and then there are settings for the smart home device history, which is any of the third-party devices that interface with it. And interestingly, uh, you can say, don't allow Amazon employees to listen to recordings. And they say that only a small fraction of recordings are actually requiring people to review them manually but just you gotta think there's gotta they must have a ton of people re reviewing <laughs> these recordings but um they say that if you disable that then you're not as likely to get good results so whatever that means but yeah. uh anyway what do you guys think yeah i mean i think these are the capabilities of these yeah. devices has definitely increased over the years i'm a little sad that and I don't understand why they haven't quite like AI enabled the results yet. Like when you ask it a question, I still get answers like, well, on the web, it found this or, <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, well, that's not really helpful. That's not helpful at all. I'm just like, why have they not AI powered these things yet? Yeah, but it's got to be coming, right? I mean, I would hope. Yeah. I mean, why would they not? But. But anyway, I, I, I think just going through settings, if you're using this a lot, unfortunately, mine has only been used as a timer in my kitchen, essentially. I think my family uses it a little bit more for music and things like that, but I definitely don't use it as much as, as I have. And I get annoyed when it just all of a sudden starts saying something randomly, which is... Do you find that it gets triggered by by uh, media that you're listening to or watching? When... Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Watching TV, it just kind of just comes on. Yeah. Typically, though, if it's built correctly, if the TV show or the commercial yeah. is built correctly, they have that sound before they say it. Oh, it, like an escape activating. kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. 
I uh I love mine. I when I you know before I before I moved out, I had one in almost every room, and at, at the new place I have a couple, and uh, I use them all the time. Wow. I like I said, I use it for reminders. I use it for my shopping list. I I have a I have a bad memory out of context. Like if you give me context, I can remember things. But if you if I don't have context and and remembering the things I need to buy at the store is one of those. But isn't that just like normal? <laughs> Who else forget the Maybe. things you're getting old? Yeah, getting old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, yeah. and I and I review these settings, and the one thing I have found is that you need to check them regularly because I've had problems where I've set them. And then, you know, they do an update mm -hmm. or whatever and something happens and they reset to the default. And uh, so it's it's one of those check it regularly and make the setting. Again. I think that's every product today. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah is. Remember Facebook, every time Tom would issue his uh, Facebook privacy guide and then two months later it would change. Uh, no, it's <laughs> two weeks later, pretty yeah, much. I was, was going to yeah. say, it wasn't that long. <laughs> it's very hard to keep up. Yeah, up to date. Yeah. So... Anyway, well, this installment of Aware Much has been brought to you by ClickArmor, the employee cyber confidence builder. And ClickArmor helps reduce cybersecurity risks to businesses by building employee confidence in spotting phishing, social engineering threats, and many other kinds of risks. And we use immersive gamified experiences to teach and assess staff. And according to Talent LMS, more than 80% of employees felt Gamification makes them more productive. So when you're frustrated that employees are not learning your cybersecurity hygiene regimes, uh, or you're experiencing a high rate of incidents involving employees, then you should come to clickarmor.ca and ask for a free trial. And you can see how gamified cybersecurity training can provide immediate results. And that's it for this installment of Aware Much. Thank you, Scott. So uh, we're getting near the end of uh, today's show. But before we do that, I had mentioned to Scott that I would talk a little bit about Black Hat yeah, uh, yeah. a couple weeks ago. I know both Kevin and Scott, you weren't there. Yeah, yeah. You probably have seen all the social posts and things about it. I, I, I actually enjoyed this trip out to Vegas. I felt, well, it was interesting for me starting a new job and I got to meet mm -hmm. a lot of new people that I work with. I was also at B-Sides Las Vegas, which I think I've talked about on the show before, but that's definitely my favorite of the conferences that week. And it's a conference I definitely recommend people checking out if you have not been to B-Sides Las Vegas. In fact, I recommend just going to any B-Sides conference for a, a smaller, a little more intimate type of experience, which I feel is greatly needed in our industry. When we have, you know, how many people go to DEF CON now? It's like 50,000. It's at the Las Vegas Convention Center. It's just enormous. And I did not stay for DEF CON, but Black Hat, Kevin, you're familiar. It's it's always very busy. Yep. But yeah, I enjoyed the week. It was good to network with people. I Like I mentioned, I gave out a bunch of shared security stickers. There's some new new listeners to the podcast. So welcome. And it's our, it's the yearly pilgrimage or yeah. as they call it, security summer camp <laughs> is the loving term apparently. So maybe Kevin will be out there next year. Yeah. I was, I was actually supposed to be out there this year and then things changed and I wasn't yeah. able to make it. Well, cool. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. All right. So thank you both as always. Great thank to you. have the gang back. And for all of our listeners, until next time, stay safe, stay secure, and stay private. Thanks for watching or listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts, follow us on X at SharedSec, and help support the podcast by joining our Patreon to get ad-free episodes, bonus content, and many more exclusive supporter-only benefits. Visit sharedsecurity.net slash supporter for more details.